Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of fantasy romance and romantic fantasy. I am here with my first cup of coffee. Oh, that's needed. Today is Tuesday, May 3rd. And um, I'm running behind. <laughs> I'm just totally behind today. It's almost nine here. I think I was um, more stressed out than I realized about my folks car accident that happened on Sunday. I talked about it some on the podcast yesterday uh, but they are both home now. My stepdad had to spend the night in the hospital and uh, but he did not require surgery on his arm. He has to get it checked out again in a couple of weeks. So I think they're fine. I have not heard yet from my mother this morning. I'm assuming she's still asleep. And then um, David had some problems with his medication last night. So he had to wake me up and have me help him with that. And so it took me a little while to go back to sleep again. So I just slept this morning. I didn't get up until like 630. <laughs> so why is it already almost nine? I don't know. I'm also moving slowly. Actually, I don't think I got up till seven. Yeah, that's true. I didn't get up till seven. So. I'm still moving slowly. I did my weightlifting. I did my stuff. Writing sucked yesterday. I did not get much done. Uh, I tried. I did my three hours. It was not very good. But um, my friend Kelly Robson said thought she was it was interesting what she said. I'm going to see if I can bring up her exact words. Which they we'll see if the computer lets me. It might take forever for the she said she said that I wasn't emotionally available for fiction. She said for writers like us who are all about emotion. She said that she could totally write like wine reviews on the day her father died but she couldn't write fiction. I think that's interesting. Do we think that's true? I don't disagree with her. It just doesn't feel that way to me but certainly I had very little writing I could do yesterday. I'm also feeling um, a bit at a loss on how to get to the end of this book. I've got about 25,000 words to go. I know what it's going to be be more uh, maybe I don't I feel like I don't quite have all the threads in my grasp but I may start at the beginning (coughs) excuse me I thought I was going to sneeze again but I didn't sorry I didn't um, pause in time for that first one. So yeah I'm thinking about going back to the beginning and starting my the revision. Um, I'm wondering if I know enough about the end to do that. Those of you who have listened to me for a long time will probably identify the stage at which I am. It's the act two climax um, and yeah. (laughs) Now that I think about it and I hear you guys out there nodding along this probably is my standard act two climax crisis and I do need to go back to the beginning. Uh, when I couldn't get much done yesterday I did go back and like start searching for my square brackets and looking up some things so that I could at least be semi productive and I went back through um, my Kindle notes on the prequel novella and put those into a, a word document. And I'm going to do that for the other books too so that I can try to order my thoughts and then maybe I will start the revision today. Um, that's probably the thing to do. I'm noticing this grapevine that's uh, crawled up on top of the lilac. I need to train that to come back on over to the actual arbor. 
I had to move over to the side because I'm so late and the sun was really shining on my usual chair. You can see. See, very sunny. Uh, once the arbor finishes leafing out, that won't be such a problem. But it's still still baby leaves. I just want to see for those of you on video. See, just like little bits of leaves. There's my hanging plant that I potted myself. <laughs> so, um, yeah, try to get back into it. It sounds like my mom won't need me to come to Tucson, so. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. Um, it's a very beautiful morning here and the lilacs really blooming. So I'm going to cut some lilacs and put those in my office and yeah, I'm clearly muzzy headed. So let's see. Um, I left my note inside, but I know what I wanted to talk about. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that we've also been watching Julia about Julia Child and I'm very much enjoying the show. Actually, we're both really enjoying it, um, which is always a good thing, but it's about when Julia Child first started her TV show and how she went about doing that. And it was, um, it's, it's really well done in that the gal that they've got playing Julia child, and I can't think of her now, her name now, I should look it up though. All right. So her name is Sarah Lancashire and she's a British actress, two years older than I am. And she's a tall gal. I don't know if she's as stout as Julia or if she's wearing, um, you know, padding and so forth, but they're not trying to make her be other than some of the things that made Julia child. So I don't know. I want to say endearing iconic that she was, um, you know, she was awkward. She was not a graceful person. So I'm thinking of other people who played Julia child. Is it, um, did Meryl Streep? play her in that one. Anyway, uh, Sarah Lancashire does a great job because she does the funny voice and people were mark on her funny way of speaking. And she is not beautiful and she is not graceful, but she has also managed to perfectly transmit the, um, what people loved about Julia child, her warmth of personality and how she did not take herself seriously. And, and at the same time that she had this ability to be completely, she was the velvet steamroller, right? She, she stood up for herself and stood up for what she wanted to do, which wasn't easy. And she, um, she, I want to say that she like very gently gets her way. She believed so utterly in what she was doing. And this episode that we watched the other night, which, um, let me see if I can go back and tell you which episode we're on. We're almost done, which is sad. Uh, it's been one of those slow drip releases. Um, it was episode seven foie gras. And I think yeah, there's just eight. So Thursday is going to be the last episode. Alas. Uh, but it was really great because she goes to New York city along with the other people who work on her show. And she, you know, gives the speech and she does gives this wonderful speech and several things happen. Um, where <laughs> it's almost like a romancing the stone theme through this movie in that, or this series in that, um, some people are completely disdainful of what she's doing. You know, a cooking show on public television, nobody watches public television. Uh, then there are the people who think that public television should only be about things that are erudite and deep. Uh, her editor who, uh, 
you know that sort of the, her her primary editor is great but then there's the gal who is the head of Knopf who uh you know published Julia's cookbook um the gal who is the head of Knopf doesn't own a television um and thinks that television is is a fad that will go away and that only books are uh permanent it's it's interesting to see the interplay of sort of these changes in thinking about stuff and but everybody's just kind of astounded that all of these housewives are watching this cooking show and making the food and they go to Lutes in New York City the publisher takes Julia and her editor out to lunch at Lutes and I, and I have to do a little aside here because I I even paused and told David that um you know every once in a while I have as a writer like this kind of jealousy where it's like well I never had the head of the publishing house take me out to lunch at Lutes in New York uh, or the equivalent I don't even know if Lutes is still there but you know times have changed obviously but also I have never been high dollar enough but then I thought well at the same time however I have had uh my two different editors take me out for lunch two different occasions and take me out for dinner um, I've had no three editors uh, so a couple other different editors have taken me out for dinner at conferences or different places and my agent has taken me out for lunch and dinner and you know so it's sort of like it's not quite on the glam scale but then I have to be really thankful and count my blessings for what I have had which has been pretty wonderful and and the, yes it is incredibly shiny I remember in uh, 2019 in the before times I was at RWA National Conference in New York City and that was when my editor at St. Martin's uh, did take me out for lunch at a very decidedly low glam place but she was um, a, a young editor and that was um, you know, what she she could afford and I still you know appreciated it and it was lovely and my agent went too and we all got treated um, and that was and, and my excuse me my publicist went too. this was all um, right before the release of the Orchid Throne and we were all super excited about it but um, feels like kind of an innocent age ago I think the Orchid Throne did fine it just didn't do as well as maybe as they hoped and then we had such big plans for the follow up for the fiery crown and that was May of 2020 you know so it was kind of um, as far as paper books go kind of a big fizzle alas but at the time we were very excited and when I got to New York City I you know flew in kind of midday and then I went to meet agent Sarah that evening for drinks and walked the you know like 10 blocks to her office from the hotel and it was um it was very shiny and I thought here I am walking through New York City to go have drinks and dinner with my agent in New York City <laughs> and it was it was awesome um, and to continue the aside there has been a uh, an article going around by uh, Christine Catherine Roosh on why you should hire an IP attorney instead of an agent and she makes you know as, as she does she's good at writing stuff up and she makes compelling arguments for why an IP attorney can be really useful to negotiate a contract for you and how they have more credentials than an agent does and yeah if you're looking for a one off negotiation then you probably are better off hiring a lawyer and her argument is is why would you you know bulk at paying a little bit of money up front to pay a lawyer and you know or maybe more than a little bit as opposed to paying 15 percent in perpetuity uh, to to some agent who doesn't even have all these qualifications and if that's your lens sure uh, and I, I don't want to I don't know if I'll go into it later this week if you guys really want to hear me talk about it you know where to find me ping me about it but um, 
the she these kinds of and i'm going to call it well i won't call it i won't use that word um but that particular angle and i have seen other people passing it around self-publishing authors who are on the virulent end of the spectrum of this is you know trad publishing is evil agents are evil and i'm not saying that's Rush's perspective, but the other people who are sharing it, you know, that this is why you should, why agents are evil and why you should never have an agent. And it's, um, it's ignoring the very re- real things that agents can do for you besides taking you out for drinks and dinner. Um, and if you guys want me to talk about that, I will, uh, but. I won't do it today because this is already a a long parenthetical Uh, back to Julia. Um, She's at the French restaurant and the French the chef the head chef of of Lutes comes to her and um, knows who she is and and this is sort of the romancing the stone aspect to it is the surprising people who know exactly who she is and the chef says um, that they have all of these people coming in who have watched the show and requesting particularly dis- dishes that she's cooked on the show wanting to have them at Lutes and even things like sweetbreads and but and you know and so it's lovely and delightful but then he follows up and this is ever so slightly spoil- spoilery so cover your ears if you want to know nothing but he then advises her to leave the cooking to the men and that uh, cooking is you know French cooking is is not for women which is ironic but then the <laughs> the show finishes up towards the end um Betty Friedan is at the uh, big press dinner for the public television awards and she and Julia start talking and Julia in her very earnest warm and welcoming way invites Betty to uh to talk because it Betty has seen the show and Betty launches into a diatribe that she is um that Julia is setting back the cause of the women's movement that she is um encouraging women to be behind the hot stove more instead of going out into the world and it's such a it's well done it's such a crushing moment because we know because and Julia says to Betty for them you don't know me at all and and it's true and we who have followed Julia's journey do know her and we know how very hard she has fought in a very feminist way to make this show happen um, in this very male dominated world and her producer is a young black woman who has also been fighting by her side and it's like Betty Friedan just like totally doesn't get it because she's hung up on the cooking aspect and the other thing that she doesn't understand is just because this is a traditionally female activity of cooking dinner and that it's these housewives who are doing it that it's about mastering something it's about the sheer delight of being able to master a skill and have it go right and wrong and I've I've talked on here many times about throwing knives and that analogy of learning as you try to learn to do something to enjoy the failures equally as well as the successes to enjoy when you don't stick the target as much as when you do which is a very Taoist perspective and it's not easy to learn but Julia Child really had that in her show because sometimes when you cook things don't turn out sometimes it just doesn't the bread doesn't rise or the sauce doesn't thicken correctly and she had a real talent for uh enjoying it anyway where she'd be like oh well (laughs) that didn't happen and and there was there's a great lesson in that and so it was um you know it's just interesting the thing that things that people grab a hold of um you know and proclaim as being worthwhile and not and serving the cause and not so yeah 
I, I mentioned that I've been listening to poetry and a new to me poem uh, that I don't recall the name of, sorry, in the sequence that Tom Hiddleston was reading. I'll leave the link up. And it was, um, it was very sad. It was about um, a, a man, the poet catching, I think it was a male, but catching a hedgehog in the mower. It might've been called the mower. And, and he finishes up, you know, and it's about how, how he's caused this, this small death. And he finishes up by saying something along the lines of, you know, that we should all be a little bit kinder to each other. And I'm, I'm thinking of that now with Betty for Dan, you know, it's like we could all stand to be kinder to each other. And on that note, I am going to go get to work. Uh, see if I can make this a more productive day than yesterday. I hope you all are being productive in the ways that you want to be. And I will talk to you all on Thursday. Bye-bye.